Welcome to your week nine lecture. You should have already read these four chapters by now. Let's get started. This week we covered the pathophysiology of the skin, muscles, and bones. We'll begin by reviewing the bones and muscles and talk about the trauma they can receive from injuries. We'll then look at autoimmune diseases and other pathologies of muscles and bones and end with the pathophysiology of the skin. The skeletal system is made up of roughly 206 bones, as may, some may have more or less due to pathological conditions or genetic variations. Bones can be dense or cortical, and they can be spongy or trabecular. This is important to review as the spongy or trabecular bones may be more susceptible to osteoporosis. Now for a review of the skeletal system from AP1, the skeletal system is made up of bones, and these are living tissues with cells called osteocytes. Osteoblast build bone, and you can remember this by the B and osteoblast is the same as B and build. Osteoclast breakdown bone. Together, these cells maintain the bone matrix and remodel the bones continuously. Your bones are not the dry or plastic ones you may have seen in models or real skeletons. They are living, breathing tissue that is constantly reforming. The bones store calcium for us, as well as phosphorus. And you, as you recall, calcitonin from the thyroid gland will help build bone while parathyroid hormone from the parathyroid gland helps break down bone. Therefore, calcitonin is used when calcium levels are too high or in hypercalcemia, while PTH is used when calcium levels are too low or hypocalcemia. And this makes a homeostatic negative feedback mechanism to regulate serum calcium. We must maintain a, maintain a specific range of calcium in the blood for muscle contraction, as we'll see. Vitamin D is essential in absorbing calcium and is made by UV radiation in the skin and activated by the kidneys. Also for the exam note, osteoprogenitor cells are the only ones that can divide. Recall the joints of the body from AP1, which joints are synarthroses or immobile. Diarthrotic or very mobile-like synovial joints. Synovial joints are the most complex and include our most important joints like knees, elbows, shoulders, and hips. Synovial fluid nourishes and lubric lubricates the joint. The muscular system is vast, as you remember from your AP1 experience. There are many, many muscles in the human body. Skeletal muscles are the most common muscles in the body, and they are only voluntary muscles. They are striated in appearance due to the skeletal muscle fibers present. Contraction is accomplished by actin and myosin, and these muscles can undergo hypertrophy and atrophy, as we discussed in the beginning of this course. Muscles are made up of several elongated segments called facils. Each muscle uh, facile is made up of several muscle fibers. Epimesium is the outer portion of the skeletal muscle. Paramesium is the outer portion of a muscle facile. The endomesium is what surrounds the muscle fibers. The sarcolemma is the outer portion of a muscle fiber. Tendons connect muscles to bones, while ligaments connect bone to bone. Both can become injured with overuse or overstretching. A strain is overstretching a tendon or a muscle or both. A sprain is injury of the ligaments with possible tearing. There are three types. We have all had broken bones or been around someone who has had one and there are different types of bone breaks to know. Here is a table I made for you to study the types of fractures. Using index cards, you can make flashcards from this table to help you remember the fracture types for the exam. Now a demonstration. Transverse is a fracture where the broken ends are close to each other. Open or compound is where a fracture causes open wound as bone protrudes out. Oblique is when a fracture occurs at an angle. Oblique can also be displaced. Commutative fracture is when there is a shattering or crushing injury. Segmental fracture is where there are two or more fracture lines. Green stick fracture is usually seen in children as an incomplete fracture. A spiral fracture is where there is a break with a twisting motion involved. In an avulsed fracture, a small piece of bone is separated from a ligament or tendon attachment site. 
A non-unit fracture cannot heal on its own as you cannot bring the ends together. This goes for the ones that are shattered or crushed, injuries to the bone. Following a fracture, bones must begin the process of healing. There are five distinct stages for bone healing following an injury like a fracture. Stage one is the inflammatory stage with bleeding between the edges of fractured bone. Stage two is the granulation stage where granulation tissue forms fibroblasts come uh, come to the area and produce fibrin and vascular tissue regenerates. Stage three is the callus formation with osteoblasts and chondroblasts rebuilding bone and cartilage respectively. The extracellular matrix begins to regenerate. Stage four is the lamellar uh, deposition stage with strengthening of the bone by ossification. Stage five is the remodeling and final stage. This is where the bone is pretty much like it was and will be at full strength in three to six months. When major trauma happens, then the patient must be fully assessed by protecting the airway and and placing it in a cervical collar until neck injury is ruled out. Evaluate their movement ability, response to stimulus, and level of consciousness. Do they have reactive pupils to light? Trauma is one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in the United States, particularly of young people. A good musculoskeletal examination begins by assessing their general appearance, contour of the muscles, alignment of the limbs, symmetry. If they are walking to you, then look at their gait. Ask them about their pain. Where is it at? Does the pain go anywhere? Is there tenderness? Look at the swelling and color. Is there an open wound present? Did the injury cause a deformity in the normal appearance? Is there changes to their sensation? Do they have paresthesia? Look at the pulse strength. Evaluate their muscle strength and use the Levitt scale. Test the range of motion. Look for stiffness of the joints, crepitus and clicking, instability or swelling of the joints. Passive range of motion is what the examiner can do with the joint and moving it around. Active range of motion is what the patient can do on their own with the joint movement. These should be equal, but with injury, there may be reduction one or more, uh, both or both due to uh, swelling, fracture or tears in ligaments or tendons. Further examination of the muscles and bones can be done with x-rays, ultrasounds, DEXA scans, CT, MRI, bone scans, and EMGs. Most musculoskeletal injuries will heal on their own, and the best initial treatment is PRICE, which stands for Protect, Rest, Ice, Compression, and Elevation. If a fracture, then it may need to cast. If an open fracture, then surgery, uh, then casting likely will need to be done. If a shattered bone, then it may need hardware to put back uh, the bone back together. Some fractures can damage arteries and nerves. In fact, one of the signs that a fracture may be present is paresthesia, which can be caused from the lack of blood supply or damage to the innervation of the area in question. Muscle injuries can also cause damage to nerves and blood vessels, and this can lead to bleeding into the muscle and compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome comes from sudden bleeding into the muscle compartment with, the swe- with swelling and injury. The patient will begin to have necrosis of the muscle and may need an amputation of the limb if this continues. This is a surgical emergency, and the pressure must be relieved quickly to save the dying tissue. Signs include recent injury or staying in one position uh, for a long period of time and having numbness and tingling of the limbs with decrease in absent pulses on examination. Bruising may be present along with swelling of the muscle and hardening of the area due to the increased pressure. Rhabdomyolysis occurs with major muscle injury or with hypothermia causing continuous shivering and thus muscle breakdown. When muscle breakdown from injury, it releases CK or creatinine kinase. High levels of this in the blood can overwhelm the kidneys and lead to acute renal failure. The urine will look dark or brown or red, but there will not be any blood present by urinalysis. The patient will complain of diffuse muscle pain and treatment is IV fluids at high rate and then Uh, continuous until CK level decreases. The kidney function will usually return to normal. Severe cases, if untreated, can lead to death or permanent renal damage. Muscle and bone can become infected. If muscle is involved, then it is cellulitis or myositis. But if the infection gets into the bone, then it's termed osteomyelitis. Here in this MRI of bilateral femurs, you can see chronic osteomyelitis in the patient's left femur. Osteomyelitis requires several weeks of IV antibiotics to improve. Signs of cellulitis will include swelling, erythema, but signs of osteomyelitis may just be bone pain. A common pathogen of osteomyelitis is Staphylococcus aureus, and it can be dormant for a time before showing up as an infection. 
diabetics with gangrene, or infected ulcers of the feet are also prone to have osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis develops when infection moves into bone, usually from a skin or muscle source. Diabetics and those with vascular problems are most at risk as their immune system cannot reach the area as easily as it does in normal individuals. Many patients go through phases of chronic osteomyelitis requiring repeat amputations as their diabetes is out of control and their vascularity is not adequate for the infection to clear and wound to heal. Diagnosis of osteomyelitis includes x-ray scans of the suspected area. Consider CT scans and MRI scans and bone scans, which are also helpful. ESR and CRP will be elevated. White blood cell count may or may not be elevated depending on the immune response to the infection. Blood cultures may also be positive. Treatment of osteomyelitis is to cut out what cannot possibly heal, then place the patient on six weeks of IV antibiotics. Getting their diabetes well controlled will also help in making sure they have good blood flow to the area. Recurrent chronic osteomyelitis is possible, so it is important to monitor these patients closely for at least two years. Remember we talked about pulmonary emboli and DVTs in week three and week five of the course. Clots can form from uh, in the leg veins, and this is called a deep venous thrombosis or DVT. They can then travel to the lungs and cause acute hypoxia. Usually the patients have sat around for a long period of time, like on a plane ride, or they may have underlying clawing disorder or smoke while on hormone therapy. It is diagnosed by CTPE study or CT angiogram, but also be seen on VQ scans, sometimes for the patients who cannot have IV contrast dye. Patients with musculoskeletal injuries have a high risk for DBT and PE. Much like a pulmonary embolism from a DBT, a fat embolism can enter the pulmonary circulation, and this is from a recent fracture of a large bone in the leg or pelvis. The fat globulus enter the bloodstream and then travel up the lung to the lung to the veins and can cause a PE-like syndrome with hypoxemia, neurological problems, and particular rash. The key to preventing this is to get bone fractures fixed quickly. Avascular necrosis is when the blood supply is cut off from a bone. This can occur in the femoral head and other areas and is tied to frequent corticosteroid use. It can also be idiopathic or due to a blood clot or fat embolus. Treatment is surgical debridement and repair. Neck or cervical pain is a common complaint among patients. Cervical sprain and strain occurs frequently and are usually due to whiplash if traumatic. Postural problems can lead to chronic cervical pain and there may be protrusions or herniations of discs in the cervical spine causing nerve impingements. Diagnosis is from x-rays, the MRI scans, and nerve conduction testing. Treatments vary depending on the cause of the neck pain. Low back pain or lumbar strain is number one complaint of patients to any provider anywhere. This is a frequent area of injury uh, due to us walking on two limbs, and the center of gravity for us in, in, is uh, in this area, bearing much of our weight. Over time, vertebral discs can herniate and rupture, pressing on nerve roots. Uh, much of the low back pain, though, is due to muscle spasms, and this can be helped by physical therapy or manipulation from chiropractors or osteopaths. Herniated discs can be found on examination with neurological testing, like straight leg raising and diminished reflexes, and muscle strength and sensation in the legs. Here's a demonstration of a herniated disc hitting the spinal cord and or nerve root. This can cause neurological problems as well as pain to the back, which radiates to the areas of the nerve root covers. Spinal nerve impingements it can be painful and debilitating, and if left untreated, can do permanent neurological damage. Degenerative disc disease, or DDD, is a common injury of the back and neck. It is basically osteoarthritis of the vertebrae. This can lead to back pain and muscle spasm, but is not serious unless there is evidence of nerve impingements. In the lower back, uh, look, at, uh, look for foot drop or signs of sciatic or sciatic nerve irritation. In the neck, look for arm weakness and pain that radiates down the arms. Back pain that gets much better with changes in position are due to musculoskeletal problems. Back pain that does not get better with changes in position is very worrisome for cancer metastasis or infection of the spine. Spinal stenosis occurs with injury or can develop over time. This narrowing of the space of the spinal cord to exist can lead to serious pain or even neurological deficits. See the spinal stenosis here highlighted in red on this MRI of a man who had a traumatic fall resulting in vertebral fracture. 
called Aquinas syndrome, is a surgical emergency. The patient needs surgical intervention within 48 hours to prevent permanent damage to the spine. This can come about slowly from DDD or from a tumor growing, but most commonly this comes from trauma like motor vehicle accidents. Patients will have bladder and bowel incontinence along with possible saddle paresthesia, which means they lose feeling in the areas where the skin would normally touch a saddle if they were riding a horse. Ankle sprains are very common injuries, and most common type are the inversion sprains. Remember, a sprain is a stretched out or damaged ligament, and ligaments attach bone to bone. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a compression of the median nerve through the carpal tunnel, which is a space the nerve passes through before it reaches the first three digits. This can be caused from repetitive movement like uh, typing or any movement that requires bending of the wrist. Patients with this will have numbness and tingling of the first three digits accompanied by pain. Uh, this usually manifests the most at night while they are trying to sleep. They will shake their uh, hand to try to get the numbness to stop or rubbing to stop the pain. Physical exam signs called tenail sign where you tap at the anterior wrist where the median nerve goes through the carpal tunnel to elicit numbness and the first three digits or phalanx test where you hyperflex the wrist to also bring about numbness and the first three digits are important physical exam findings. Testing with nerve conduction velocities is diagnostic. Treatment is wrist splinting, and if this does not work, then do surgery to free up the median nerve. Lateral epicondylitis is tennis elbow and is another injury from repetitive motion. This is caused from radial nerve, uh, sorry, radial humeral bursa being inflamed and only needs rest and abstaining from tennis for a while. Osteoporosis is a dangerous condition where the significant bone loss, particularly in trabecular bone, that results in fractures like hip fractures and vertebral compression fractures. This occurs mostly in older Caucasian and Asian women. It is a very silent disease and must be screened for early before fracture can occur. Women should be assessed for osteopenia and osteoporosis starting with menopause or if they stop producing estrogen for any reason. Females are at risk more than males. A, fe a, male, a family history can also be a risk factor. Women who are small framed and thin develop osteoporosis more than women who are overweight or obese. Lack of calcium and vitamin D, lack of weight bearing exercise, smoking, eating disorders, gastric bariatric surgeries, and other factors can increase risk for osteoporosis. The main test for osteopenia and osteoporosis is the DEXA scan, which stands for Dual Energy X-ray Absorptometry. This tests uh, both the lumbar spine as well as the hip for calcium density. This is compared to a female of the same age with normal bone density, and the computer comes up with a T-score and a Z-score and places the patient in a standard deviation risk range based upon these scores. For example, a patient with a T-score of negative 0.6 and a Z-score of negative 0.4 then places them in the uh, just above the yellow region, which is osteopenia. The red zone is osteoporosis, so a T and Z score of negative 2.5 would then be osteoporosis. Treatment for osteopenia and osteoporosis is the same. The patient needs to increase calcium, vitamin D intake, begin weight-bearing exercise, potentially add a bisphosphonate depending on how bad their scores are. They may need calcitonin and other medications if they are worsening. What if I told you that if an elderly patient with a gait instability used a cane inst in, instead of nothing, then they would greatly increase their lifespan? This is true as the leading cause of death in many elderly populations is a hip fracture. In the past, nearly 100% of those with hip fractures would die. But now, in the modern world of medicine, we can repair broken hips and no longer require the months of bed rest and leg traction of the earlier 20th century. Hip fractures can be debilitating and lead to death as they increase the risk for both DVT and PE as well as pneumonias from being immobile and bed bound. The goal of treatment, therefore, is restoring mobility as quickly as possible. The fractures occur from falling and are worse in patients who are thin, especially those who have osteoporosis and osteopenia. This is why we do DEXA scanning to prevent hip fractures. A patient with suspected hip fracture will likely be thin, older, a woman may carry a diagnosis of osteoporosis or osteopenia. They will be unable to move their leg very far and have decreased range of motion. Diagnosis is by x-ray, but CT scan may become necessary for difficult to assess images. Surgery is usually 
this treatment uh, unless the patient is too sick or able to survive it. Orthopedic surgery on the leg or hip increases the risk for DVTs and therefore PEs, so prophylaxis must be used. There are several medications you can use to prevent DVTs in the patient in the hospital or postoperatively after you uh, have an orthopedic surgery. Your book does a comparison between these two medications, Fonda Paranox, uh, and it may have has several advantages over warfarin, also known as cumin, which is the old way of doing post-operative DVT prophylaxis. As you can see, there is one daily dose, no monitoring like cumin needs, and you do not have to restrict the patient's diet to, to stay away from vitamin K. Vertebral compression fractures happen in older people with osteoporosis. They are very painful, and one compression fracture can cause another. The treatment is usually kyphoplasty if a new fracture to uh, strengthen the area, uh, uh, but this too can cause a new compression fracture above or below it. There is weakness in one of those other vertebrae. Again, this is why osteoporosis must be treated aggressively. Rotator cuff. Uh, the shoulder is a frequent site of injury as we see our shoulder routinely throughout, as we uh, use our shoulders routinely throughout the day. A tear of the rotator cuff muscle or tendons can occur with only minor injuries. These can be healed over time with physical therapy or may need surgery. If you want to remember the muscles of the rotator cuff, use the mnemonic SITS, S I T S, which is an acronym that stands for supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. A frozen shoulder is one that cannot move easily and needs physical therapy. It's called adhesive capsulitis. There are several shoulder exams tests uh, to see if the patient may have a rotator cuff problem. Distal ra radial fractures of the wrist are also very uh, common uh, when people fall forward. They tend to try to catch themselves with their hands when they fall forward. If you fall forward with an extension, of the wrist or extended wrist out trying to catch yourself then a Coles fracture can occur and if you just fall on your wrist while they're flexed then a Smith fracture may happen. The knee is a complicated synovial joint and can become injured with ligamental and meniscal tears. The MCL and ACL are frequent injured with the ACL the most, most frequent. To determine if a patient has one of these injuries, there are various physical exam tests one can perform. An MRI scan will confirm your findings and the patient most likely will need surgery. A physical exam of the knee can give the examiner an idea of what, what, where there are ligaments or meniscal tears. The anterior drawer test is a great test to test the ACL. The examiner begin, uh, brings the proximal end of the tibia forward while stabilizing the foot. If there is lactity there then an increased pain, then this can show an ACL tear is present. McMurray's test is for a meniscal tear and involves flexing and extending the knee passively with external rotation. Lockman's test is similar to the anterior drawer sign, except you stabilize the femur and also test for the uh, tears in the ACL. Apley's grind or compression test uh, looks for meniscal tear and involves the examiner placing the patient prone on a table and compressing and rotating the distal leg at the knee. Plantar fasciitis is very common and occurs due to repetitive motion and causes heel and sole pain in the foot. Stretching exercises can help as well as shoe inserts and steroid injections if necessary. Rickets is vitamin D deficiency in children that can be corrected. See the bowing of the legs here. The children can receive vitamin D and calcium supplementation which will reverse the damage done from their calcium and vitamin D deficiencies. This is why children really need to drink their milk. Check their serum ionized calcium PTH level along with the alkaline phosphatase 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. Multiple x-rays should be uh, done. After the growth plates close, one can still have vitamin D deficiency severe enough that it gives them soft bones. This is called osteomalacia. Diagnosis is by x-ray along with serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. Give vitamin D replacements to treat this. Everyone gets osteoarthritis. It is the one arthritis we all get to experience. OA is the most common arthritis because of this. OA is the wear and tear of the joints and occurs with loss of cartilage and bone malformations like osteophytes. Risk factors include being older, obese, trauma, overuse or underuse of joints, lack of exercise, and also increase, will also increase lack, uh, risk for OA. 
all, all our three D's show up in the hands first. <clears throat> it makes sense since we use our hands more than any other part of our musculoskeletal system. They especially, this especially hold true with OA is uh, usually pain in the thumbs is the first sign along with enlargements of the distal interphalangeal joints called Heberden's nodes and more proximal interphalangeal joints called Bouchard's nodes. OA can go to any joint as well, like the shoulders, knees. It can go to the back and is a contributor to DDD. OA can also alter your gait. It can be very painful. Diagnosis is by history and, and exam along with x-rays of the hands along with the joints that are most painful and stiff. You can see joint space narrowing and osteophyte formation on the x-rays and further signs of, uh, uh, as further signs of OA. Treatment is NSAIDs and exercise along with low impact uh, uh, exercise like using an elliptical or doing water aerobics. Conjoint sulfate has helped some with, the, with this type of arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, is an autoimmune disease, which is a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, as you recall, that causes joint destruction and inflammation. It is the most common of the autoimmune arthritides. They have morning stiffness with symmetrical joint involvement. They could have rheumatoid nodules around the elbows. You will find most arthritis cases start in the hands, as they're the most used joint. It is the only autoimmune arthritis that can cause joint destruction. Rheumatoid arthritis is diagnosed by a good history and physical examination. RA runs in families and women who are affected more often than men. Get x-rays of the hands, involved joints, test for rheumatoid factor in the serum, as well as anti-CCP antibody, which is more sensitive for RA than RF. ASR and C-reactive protein will be elevated as there is active inflammation. First-line therapy is NSAIDs and immune modulators like methotrexate. Patients with RA may experience septic arthritis as they are on immunosuppressants. Steroids, have, uh, synovial, uh, st steroids and, uh, and have synovial joints that are damaged for repeated inflammation. Other sources of septic arthritis is that of STDs like gonorrhea, which is more common in women. It can affect the wrists, ankles, or knees and comes from Neisseria gonorrheal infections. Withdrawing synovial fluid can aid in the diagnosis as can blood cultures. IV antibiotics are needed at first, and then you can switch to oral antibiotics. Systemic lupus erythematous, or SLE, is an autoimmune disease of mostly women and can affect multiple organ systems. It can have the classic malar rash or butterfly rash. It frequently has a positive ANA. That is not diagnostic, as many other autoimmune diseases can also have a positive ANA. It can cause Raynaud's phenomenon or disease, or disease. It runs heavily in families. Diagnosis by history and physical examination in labs, just like RA. There are 11 criteria for, those di for the diagnosis. Many have positive ANA, and those with nephritis may have positive anti-double-stranded DNA tests. Treat with NSAIDs, corticosteroids, anti-malaria drugs like hydroxychloroquine, and also methotrexate. It is interesting how malaria drug hydroxychloroquine works on these patients. It is the most important of the medications listed here. Sarcoidosis is another autoimmune disorder. This one is associated with accumulation of T cells and macrophages in organs. This causes granuloma formation. Lungs are a frequent uh, involved organ, as are the skin and the eyes. They can have erythema and nodosum. Diagnosis by history and physical exam along with chest x-rays, biopsy of the granulomas is mandatory. Steroid treatment is the best treatment and can be curative, although some need immunosuppressive agents as well. Scleroderma can cause Crest syndrome. This stands for calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasias. Calcinosis can cause painful fingers with calcium deposits along with Raynaud's causing vasoconstriction of arterioles. They will also have thickening and tightening of the fingers and hands, which will contribute to hand pain. Treatment is, is similar to other diseases we've already mentioned. Psoriatic arthritis accompanies psoriasis, which is a scaly skin rash on the elbows and knees and sometimes between the toes or behind the, uh, the ears. It is similar to eczema, but differs in the presence uh, of auspit sign, which is when you have a flake of skin come out with a spot of blood left behind. This is a positive if psoriasis, this is positive in psoriasis as the inflammation goes deep 
as about the dermis where there are blood vessels present. PSA comes in several forms depending on the areas with the most degeneration. Patients have pain, swelling, and can have dactylitis or sausage fingers like an ankylosing spondylitis. They'll usually have psoriasis, but maybe this may be vague and hard to find at times. Nail changes are common with pitting and ridging along with uh, onycholosis. Like with any arthritis, we start with hand x-rays, but the changes may be subtle at first. Like with RA, methotrexate is the drug of choice and it's used for both the rash and the arthritis part of the psoriasis. NSAIDs are also helpful. Methotrexate will weaken the immune system though and is an immune system modulating drug. Lyme disease is from tick bites, particularly that of the deer tick. It is predominant in certain geographical areas where this tick exists, and the bacteria responsible for it is called Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, Less than half recall the tick bite, and it can make up, uh, take up to two weeks before symptoms begin. A bullseye's rash is a characteristic of this disease. It usually presents with arthralgias, fatigue, myalgias, and headache. It can worsen if not treated, but once treated, it should improve. There's also chronic versions of this disease following treatment that have some controversy. The treatment is with doxycycline. Diagnosis can be hard if the rash is not present, as the antibody test can be frequently false negative. Doxycycline must be completed to alleviate symptoms and the disease. Again, a post syndrome has been reported but is not fully understood and may be uh, from a prolonged immune response. Ankylosing spondylitis is an autoimmune disease that begins in patients in their 20s or 30s, usually affects the lower back. It can cause sacro sacroiliitis as well as bamboo spine, which is seen here on this x-ray. Those with HLA B27 positive disease can have a systemic autoimmune attack of the lungs and other organs. So the important aspect of this disease to remember for the exam is the presence of sacroiliitis, possible dactylitis, as we saw in psoriatic arthritis, but do not get these two confused. Iritis and pulmonary fibrosis can also be seen in this disease it is the most severe uh, form, which is usually HLA-B27 positive. The patients are usually male and young as well. Some new data may show there will be more women with this disease than previously thought. Treatment is with immune modulating medications. Remember tuberculosis from the pulmonary and bacterial lectures? It can also manifest as osteomyelitis in the vertebral spine. This can happen especially in children in third world countries causing a terrible kyphosis along with pain and possibly death. TB can stay in the vertebra for years before it manifests and may even yield negative P PD tests. Pain, fever, and kyphosis are all signs of POTS disease, which is TB osteomyelitis of the vertebrae. Treatment is the same regimen of antibiotics we use for pulmonary TB. It takes a long time to clear. You can possibly aspirate this bacteria from joint uh, aspirations or, or biopsies of the bone. POTS disease was around the ancient past as we see this priest who was mummified at the time of the Egyptian pharaoh Amon in the 21st dynasty. See his obvious kyphosis. Gout is an arthritis caused by the inability to process or eliminate uric acid effectively. It begins usually in the first metatarsal or great toe bone or joint. The enlargement of this joint is known as gout, a gouty tophi. Getting a sample of the joint synovial fluid is the most diagnostic of this disease. Risk factors for gout include obesity, eating too much rich food with high purine content like liver, for example, or cheese and wine, alcohol consumption, family history, being on chemotherapy, and certain medications. Many times gout will be in one joint, but it can be present in multiple joints. Most commonly, it presents in the first metatarsal or gray toe. Patients will not tolerate clothes or sheets on the joint when it's inflamed. This is an important clinical finding in gout. A serum uric acid level is not diagnostic of gout, but you, and you must aspirate the joint and see if uric acid crystals uh, are present, as we have in this slide. See their needle-like shape? Treatment is colchicine and NSAIDs, possibly steroids if it's really bad. After the acute flare, start allopurinol to prevent recurrence. Probenicid may also be necessary. 
Polymalgia rheumatic or PMR is an interesting condition in older people who awaken with neck and shoulder stiffness and pain. They may also have pain in the pelvic girdle area. The pain and stiffness eventually improve as the day progresses, but it's very physically limiting and affects their lifestyle significantly. They have no other signs or other arthritis like RA or SLE, but do have elevated SED rates or sediment, uh, ESRs or sedimentation rates. You give them a trial of corticosteroids, usually a tapering dosage, and they improve dramatically. No one knows the cause of this condition, but it's associated with giant cell arteritis, so it's likely autoimmune in nature. Polymyositis or dermatomyositis are rare autoimmune diseases that cause inflammation of muscles. Dermatomyositis also involves the skin. Early symptoms are vague and later involve muscle weakness. Muscle biopsy is the definitive way to diagnose these two diseases. Now we review the skin. The most superficial layer of the system is the epidermis. The epidermis is the most superficial layer with the stratum corneum most, is, the most, is the most superficial and stratum basal or gervantibum as its deepest. After the epidermis is the basement membrane, not showed here well, then the dermis which is, has the most of the structures of the skin including nerve endings, hair follicles, sebaceous or oil producing glands or sweat glands. The area labeled fat layer is the hypodermis or subdermal layer. It is not part of the skin but divides the skin from the muscles below. It contains the larger blood vessels and nerves along with body's main fat storage. Macules are flat and distinctive in color like these H spots or solar spots on the dorsum of the hand. A papule is raised and solid and usually small. They are less than one centimeter in diameter. A nodule is much uh, bigger, raised, and solid mass, greater than one centimeter. These can be benign or malignant, similar to a tumor. The medical term for a mole is a nevus. A polyp is another solid growth that usually has a small stalk and it projects from, a, uh, projects from, and it can be found on anybody's surface, including the inside of the large bowel. A bullet is a large blister. It has a thin layer filled with fluid and it must be uh, larger than half a centimeter. The plural form of is bulle. A small blister is a vesicle less than half a centimeter. A cyst is also a filled mass but is much deeper and has a thicker surrounding layer. It can be filled with fluid, air, fat, or other substances. A wheel is a raised area due to an allergic reaction. We also make them when we do a TB skin test called the PPD test we talked about in, earlier in this course. Allergic skin reactions are associated with histamine release from mast cells. A thickened area of the skin is a lichenification. This plaque is an example. A plaque is a raised, flat-topped lesion greater than 2 centimeters. There are various birthmarks one can see on infants and young children. Here are the most common ones. Spider veins are visible, blood vessels that go away, strawberry hemangiomas are also not permanent, and due to vascular tumor and Mongolian spots will vanish with time and look like bruising on the back side of the infant. Port wine stains, however, are permanent and are uh, fortunately very rare. Cherry angiomas, also known as senile angiomas, are raised red and solid papules. They form as we get older and on sun-exposed skin and are benign. Telangiectasias are blood vessels that come close to the surface of the skin as we age and the skin is thinning. They can also form on persons who readily use alcohol and develop alcoholic liver disease. Hair follicles can become infected with bacteria causing folliculitis and if left untreated, can become furuncles and this can develop into a carbuncle or multiple furuncles at once. The redness on the surface from an infection with bacteria is called cellulitis. Remember erythema means redness and edema means swelling. Changes in nail uh, fingernails can tell us if there are diseases present. We already showed you pitting nails with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis where they split apart. Clubbing is seen in certain diseases like respiratory diseases of COPD and emphysema. Spooning is seen with iron deficiency anemia, as you recall from earlier in this course. Bose lines are seen with nail trauma or with Raynaud's phenomena. Tinea is a fungal infection of the skin. See the red leading edge that gives it away while the center is now not infected. 
It is named by where it is located on the patient, like tinea capitis if on the scalp, or tinea pedis on the feet, or tinea caporis if on the body. It is commonly known as ringworm due to the leading edge uh, redness appearance. Eczema is very itchy red rash, usually due to allergic reaction. Pruritus means itchy. Scabies is caused by mites, but more on the pres presence of where the mite was than where the mite is now. The skin has to be has to have time to react to the mite, and the mite will burrow, causing lines to form from the initial rash. Pruritus is the most common symptom of this disease. Petechia are small, tiny bruises, usually seen in fevers or platelet disorders. Purpura are larger bruises, like what most of us see if we hit our leg on a table or something. Ecchymosis is a very large bruise and may come from trauma or it could be from another underlying health issue like a coagulopathy. Warts also come from viruses like HPV, not frogs as some may think. Hyperhidrosis is excessive sweating and may be due to hyperthyroidism, brain issues, or some drugs. And hydrosis is lack of sweating and can, and can be from hypothyroidism or could be from clogged sweat glands. Acne is something we have all experienced. This is where the sweat glands and pores become infected with bacteria. If there are dead skin cells at the surface, then there is a blackhead or comedo. If the hair follicle becomes involved, then it will turn to folliculitis. But if it stays at the pore or hair shaft, then we will have acne. If it fills with pus, then we'll see a pustule. Treating acne involves keeping the skin clean and less oily. If severe, consider Accutane. Acne vulgaris is an adolescence in some women who are pregnant and is due to the bacteria P. acnes. Acne rosacea is the mid in middle-aged adults and is more of an inflammatory process. Losing hair is similarly in, in for both men and women and actually occurs equally in both sexes, but women are less obvious due to wigs. Alopecia is the medical term for baldness. Alopecia areata is the sudden loss of hair. Some skin and hair disorders are psychological manifestations that may just have pruritus without any clear cause to pull, or pulling out their hair or even cutting themselves. Psychological counseling and sometimes medications like anti-anxiety drugs or antidepressants are needed to help. A very rare but very dangerous condition is that of Steven Johnson syndrome, which occurs after infection with certain medications or, or, or medications like antibiotics. It is an autoimmune attack on the skin causing blisters and bullae with slothing off of large areas of the skin. Syphilis is an STD that starts as painless oral genital ulcers, then evolves to a macular papular rash that involves the palms of the hands. Lastly, it is a terrible neurological manifestations and the returns of the ulcerations all over the body. It is easily treatable with penicillin. Actinic keratoses are raised, rough, scaly, red plaques that are pre-malignant lesions, and lenticos are age spots and are brown in color and very flat. Basal cell skin cancers and squamous cell skin cancer are the most common form of skin cancer and are slow growing and can invade surrounding tissues but don't usually metastasize to other areas of the body. They can usually be removed easily unless on the nose or the face and they may, then may require a Mohs procedure which spares skin. Malignant melanoma is the rarest of the skin cancers, but it is also the deadliest. It is flat with asymmetric shape and color. It grows quickly and changes relatively fast. UV radiation is the main cause, particularly in tanning beds. Diagnosis is by skin biopsy and staging should be done with MRI of the head and CT PET scanning, as this can spread quickly from just a very small lesion. Radiation and chemotherapy along with surgical removal are all treatment options. This ends the week nine lecture. Now let's go do uh, practice qu uh, quizzes in the Davis Advantage.